Ego Trippin. I like the poem Ego Trippin by Nikki Giovanni. ECSU presents Honoring Black Life, a conversation with Nikki Giovanni, a part of the Community Connections Performance and Lecture Series. My name is Jasmine Roundtree. I am a senior. I am an English major with a concentration in mass communications. When I hear the name Nikki Giovanni, I think of her collection of poems, Make Me Rain. Be inspired. Well, in that collection of poems, she actually had a quote that said, I think that really pushed younger protesters to really advocate for um, community change or just being more proactive in black arts. Be empowered. Ego tripping, so there's a line, it says, I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. So that basically means like, I'm letting you into my world to understand my perspective. You can't tell me who I am. You have to figure it out. So that's my favorite quote by Nikki Giovanni from that poem. Be a part of the experience. Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. on ECSU's YouTube channel. I'm Philip Strickland, Director of Institutional Trust at First Citizens Bank. I'm extremely honored to bring you greetings on behalf of Elizabeth City State University's Community Connections Performance and Lecture Series. First Citizens Bank and several other sponsors recognize the importance of the mission of Community Connections to produce cultural experiences which can be enjoyed by students, faculty and staff, as well as the community at large. As you know, many of these events would have taken place in person. However, during these unprecedented times, through the commitment of the university, the Community Connections Committee and its sponsors, we wanted to ensure that we continue to provide a place of toge togetherness. This evening, we will kick off the first of three events for spring 2021. Tonight, we are honoring Black Life, a conversation with Ms. Nikki Giovanni. As a special tribute to Ms. Giovanni during Black History Month, a few ECSU students would like to share a piece of work to honor her life's contribution. Please enjoy tonight's lecture and conversation, and at this time, it is my pleasure to present to you, History Lives in Me. lives in me. And when I look in the mirror, I see the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the self-love in Malcolm X, the fearlessness in Harriet Tubman. I see the determination of Serena Williams, the trailblazer in Tyler Perry, and the poetry that inhabits Nikki Giovanni. I see the mother of Breonna Taylor, the innocence of Tamir Rice, the silence of George Floyd. I see the sacrifices of those who died for a movement they had no idea they were a part of. I see the honor in their deaths, the impact of their lives. I see the continuation of a generation that refuses to die. I see the hate, the hurt. I see the massacre, the genocide that was in there, but also the healing, the strength, the resilience, and the power. I see the reparation of love over and over again. I see the rhythm and blues, the culture of soul food, and the peace and prayer. I see all that you were and all that I could be. I see myself, black, beautiful, and free, because history lives in me.
Good evening. I am Tatiana Kio, a senior studying birth to kindergarten. I am truly honored to introduce our speaker for the evening. She is one of my favorite poets, so this moment is most rewarding for me. Nikki Giovanni is a world-renowned poet, writer, commentator, activist, and educator. Over the past 30 years, the outspoken nature of her writing and speaking has brought the eyes of the world upon her. One of the most widely read American poets, she prides herself on being a Black American, a daughter, a mother, a professor of English. The Academy of American Poets voted Giovanni number one poet for the spring of 2007. Giovanni remains as determined and committed as ever to the fight for civil rights and equality. She has received 21 honorary doctorates and a host of other awards, including Woman of the Year, titles from three different magazines, and the Governor's Awards in the Arts from both Tennessee and Virginia. Since 1987, Nikki Giovanni has taught writing and literature at Virginia Tech, where she is a distinguished professor. As a devoted and passionate writer, teacher and speaker, she inspires not only her students, but also readers and audiences nationwide. Please do not forget to join me after Ms. Giovanni's lecture for the highly anticipated Q&A session. This is where you will have the opportunity to pose questions. Please send your questions to ECSU Community Connections at ecsu.edu. Again, that's ecsu Community Connections at ecsu.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our speaker for the evening, my soror, Miss Nikki Giovanni. Thank you very much. I hope I remember to unmute myself. I, I'm, I'm not good at material. Thank you, Elizabeth City. I have not been down to visit with Elizabeth City for quite a while, so I'm, I'm glad to be back. When we think about Black History Month, it's a great idea because it's actually American History Month. When we think about what we have brought, what, what the Africans brought to America, we brought a song, we brought some food, we brought an idea that no matter what is happening in life, life itself is worth living. I wrote a poem because of you, Tamika, that I would, I would like very much to read because right now, there's a problem in America with immigrants. And I wanted to start, I wanted to open my, my lecture with immigrants because we are all immigrants. Everyone in America is an immigrant. Some of us did not want to be here. Some of us did not ask to be here. Some of us did, but we're all immigrants. Raise your hand in favor of immigrants. How many of you sitting here think some woman of color black, brown, yellow, white, woke up this morning thinking, golly, I can go to the airport and clean toilets. Raise your right hand. How many of you sitting here woke up this morning think, how lucky can they be? Oh, Lordy, I wish I could do that. Raise your left hand. How many of us sitting here gave $1 to those women knowing they are underpaid and not appreciated at all. Raise either hand. Did you know if we all gave $1 every time we urinated, those women might take $100 home to feed their mother, their children, their uncle who moved in with them, their husband who might beat them? Raise any hand. How many of you, when you see these women say, thank God it's not me, raise your hands. And clap. And I wanted to start with that because we in America have recently had a lot of difficulty in deciding who is an American and who should be. This is a nation that has grown from people who were brought here for one reason or born here for another or who've only known here for another. And this is a good thing. What has made our nation strong is that we have opened our arms to everybody. We are not afraid. One of the advantages for all of us who are Black, all of us in this room here, it, I'm sorry I'm not with you, but one of the advantages is that we, we who are Black, are not afraid of people who are not. We are not afraid of, of what is called foreigners. We are not afraid of what are called 
aliens. I am a space freak. I really just love the idea that one day I cannot, I'm, I'm, I'm not in good shape and I, I'm, it'll never happen. But I always wanted to be able to go to Mars, just to be able just to visit for a year or so. Mars used to be over a year to get there. It's now down to a year to go, a year to stay, and a year to come. I always wanted to go to Mars. And people would say, well, you know, if you go to Mars, there may be aliens up there. And I say, well, I'm a black woman. So the advantage for me is that I have lived with aliens down here. I don't have to worry about aliens anyplace else. I don't do those dumb movies that are always showing some monstrous looking something that's gonna to come to eat me up. I'm not worried about being eaten up by something from outer space. I'm worried about shot, being shot in the back as I am unarmed. I'm worried about my son being shot in the back. I am worried about what happens to me here on earth. I'm not worried about what's out there. And I think it's so important when I think about you youngsters in college and you are very important. I was a graduate of Fisk University's small school in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm so proud as we all are that we now have a vice president of the United States who is a graduate of Howard University, a federal institution started because we wanted the enslaved to be able to read and write. But they told a story, whether they could read or write anyway. They sang a song that told a story, that showed. They followed, they too, Harriet Tubman, followed a star. And in following that star, she found freedom. And we are all very proud of, of Miss Tubman. If I had lived then and Miss Tubman had come along and had said, well, Nikki, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna leave tonight. We're gonna run, we're gonna get away from here. I don't know, I might have, have said, well, that's a good idea, Miss Tubman, maybe I'll go. But then I have to think about having been stolen from the African nation, having been sent, which I'm sure I would have been, by my mother, out to my grandmothers, out to the, to the forest, and hoping that my grandmother could protect me. And my grandmother, recognizing that she no longer could, hearing the sounds coming, hearing the feet coming, hearing the voices of the men coming, my grandmother put in my hand a peanut and said, don't forget me. And when I was brought to this area that we are now calling the United States, which wasn't united nor states then, I planted that. I was, I was put on an auction block and I was sold, but I held on to that peanut. And when I finally was sent somewhere to build a community, to build a family with people I never knew before, I planted that and I planted that peanut. I live, I live in Virginia. They call themselves the peanut state, but there's nothing about Virginia that is, is normal to the peanut. We bought the peanut here and I planted that. So when Ms. Tubman said to me, I'm ready, you know, we'll take you with us. I'm gonna come by when it gets dark. I probably would say, well, thank you, Ms. Tubman, but I'm staying here. I promised my grandmother that I would plant this peanut and that I would remember her and the peanut would be here when all else is gone that my family would be here when all else is gone. So I would not run. People would say, you know, she's crazy. She should have run when she could. She, she enjoyed being enslaved. Somebody would make a movie and show me. So happy to take care of Miss Scarlett. So happy to be on the plantation. And that's just not what happened. But I had a promise to keep. So did Virginia. And so does America. The difference between the two is that I kept my promise. I remember my grandmother. I remember my ancestors. I remember my great grandmother. I remember some of the things that they cooked. I remember the stories that they told. I kept my promise to my ancestors. America has not kept its promise to us, to the rest of the world. When we were dealing with that, Ms. Tubman, we're all proud of Ms. Tubman, of course. 
because you couldn't be proud of the bravery of the courage that it took to run away from the horror that is slavery. Slavery is not a good idea. I'm not here to say that it is, but I wanna remind us and I wanna remind you youngsters at college right now that some people stayed and the people who stayed, stayed with the hopes that one day their ancestor, one day their children would be free. They stayed to build communities. They stayed because the land belonged to them because for 200 years, we worked this land and we were not going to leave it. Some of us stayed. We forget the strength of those who stayed behind. We sometimes don't recognize what it took to decide to build a church, a school, a store, to sell the yams we picked from the ground, the tomatoes we carefully watched turn red on the vines, to seek the okra pods, as well as to pick our own cotton. We took pride in our work and lovingly encouraged our daughters to dream. We sent them, our daughters, to school then, to college, and they stayed to help others. 100 years is not so long when we plant with love and patience, when we find that song that gives us the strength to go on. And it's so important. This was written for the 100th anniversary of the 13th Amendment, but it's so important that you youngsters remember what it means to all of us that you are going forward that there was a time when we could not read or write and we wanted our children to learn to read and write. So that when another generation came along and you can ask your grandmothers about this, it was a, it was a, a joy that a, a, a black youngster could go to kindergarten, that's the truth, could go to kindergarten. And if you could graduate from kindergarten, you got to wear a white dress, and you got to put on white socks and your white patent leather shoes got polished. And you walked down the aisle and they gave you a certificate. And your grandmother, and if you were lucky, your great grandmother were there. And they said, yeah, my baby graduated from kindergarten. And as we took another step forward, as we moved up Jacob's ladder, you and I graduated for eighth grade and our parents did not go to work that day. Those of us who are, were farmers did not go farming. They came to watch us walk down the aisle. And when our names were called, they jumped up and down, they clapped. My baby graduated from eighth grade. And as we moved up one more step, we got, we who were lucky, graduated from high school and our grandmothers, because our great grandmothers by then would be probably gone, but our grandmothers were there and they came and they sat and they wore their hats. If you remember those old ladies, they put their Sunday best dress on and they put their, their big hat on and they wore their hat. And when the ceremony was over, they went back and talked to their friends and they said, my grandbaby graduated from high school. They were so proud that we had done what everybody said could not be done. And now we have you in college and we are so proud. If you sometimes say to yourself, I'm sick of college, I don't wanna be bothered. Try to think of those women sitting in heaven being incredibly proud of you that their baby is in college and now going to graduate. You don't graduate for yourself because if there's something you need to know, wherever you go for your job, they'll teach you. You graduate for those old ladies sitting in heaven, being so proud of you. You go forward because there were people only a couple of hundred years ago who were not allowed to hold books, who if they had been captured with a book, they would have lost an arm. They would have lost at least a hand. We've watched these. And so we're very, very proud to see you. A great part of our history of being here in America is the ability to learn. There's a great woman named Fannie Lou Hamer 
She's from Roeville, Mississippi. You should know Mrs. Hamer. And Mrs. Hamer's desire always was to vote. And she finally, in the 60s, after Jack Kennedy was murdered, was assassinated, she finally said, I'm going to organize. I'm not going to let this happen. And she organized in her area, Roeville, Mississippi, so you can see where how small it is. And she saved, she and her friends saved up their nickels and dimes. And they rented a bus. And they took that bus over to uh, Atlantic City, where the Democrats were having their convention. And they demanded the right to be heard because the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which Mrs. Hamer had formed, demanded that they were the rightfully, they were the right people to represent Mississippi for, for the Democrats, not the, sec, not, not the segregationists who were there. Lyndon Johnson, as you know, was president then. And Lyndon Johnson was a politician and he was a master politician, honestly. So he was trying to figure out how do I get this settled without it being ugly? So he went to Mrs. Hamer and he said to her, let's talk. They sat down and he said, let, 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 let's talk. Why don't we give you two seats and we'll figure out something else by 1968. And Mrs. Hamer looked at the president of the United States, a woman from Ruleville, Mississippi. And she said, we didn't come here for no two seats. And they got on the bus and went back to Mississippi. When the bus crossed the Mississippi line, they of course pulled her out because we know Mississippians can be cruel people. And maybe not everybody, maybe there's somebody, but I, they were. And they pulled her over, they pulled her out of the bus and they beat her. And it was a terrible, terrible beating. And I wonder how many of you to whom I am speaking now are registered to vote. You're North Carolinians. We saw how important it was in Georgia for Stacia Abrams to be our current hero. We saw how important it was because we defeated the segregationists, the liars, the cheats in Georgia. And we now have the people we wanted to represent us in Georgia. I wonder how many of you are registered to vote. You might say, well, it doesn't matter. They're not gonna count my vote anyway. You don't care what they do with your vote. You care what you do with your vote. That's what you have to remember. It's yours. Somebody may do something that is not fair. It's, you know, I don't know what people do with things. I know this. You have to decide what you do with what is yours. If we go back a little bit to Mississippi, there was a 14 year old boy. There's something about 14 year old boys that people like to beat up and kill. It's 14 year old boy. He had a, a stutter and he had a bit of a limp and his mother was worried about him. And his mother thought, well, he should go down and visit his, his, his uncle, Moe's Wright. He should go down and visit him and he'll be safe because if I let him stay in Chicago, he'll join a gang or he'll end up doing drugs. It'll be something bad. So she sent him down to Mississippi to be safe. And like any other 14 year old boy, and some of you have been 14, he wanted to show up. So his cousins, he had a little more money than they did. He had a couple of quarters and they went to the store and his cousin said, now don't say anything to that woman because it's a problem. And he wanted to show, I'm not afraid. And he said some, something to that woman. He wanted to buy a piece of candy. He said something. And they, his cousins ran out of the store and said, oh my. When Mose Wright came in from work in the fields, they told him what had happened. And Mose immediately knew that this is going to be a problem. He gathered his family into his car. But he said to Emmett, because he couldn't stop it, they had surrounded him by this one. They were going to come and get him. And he said, he tried to explain. Emmett didn't know what he was doing. He tried, to, he begged and he pleaded, but that was not going to get it. They were going to take him out and they were going to beat him. So he was going to hope that all that was going to happen was that he would be beaten. He was going to hope that he would not find Emmett swinging from a tree 
Nina Simone said, Southern trees, they are strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. He had to hope that they would not murder a 14 year old boy. But he put his family in the car and they drove all night up to Chicago. And Mose dropped them off at the relatives and he turned around and came back. And of course, Emmett was dead, we knew that. And there was gonna be a trial, there was gonna be a jury trial. And Mose Wright decided and knew, today is the day I have to stand up. And he decided he is going to do that. I'm not going to, I have a voice and I am going to use it. When they called Mr. Wright to the stand, they said, do you see the person who took your children out, your son, your nephew out? And Mose pointed his finger and said, Dar he. We talk a lot about important and good words, but two of the most important words in America are dar he. Of course, the jury found him not guilty. We know that. They also sold the story to Look Magazine for $3,000. We knew that. It's all ugly, but Mr. Wright was not going to be quiet. That was his voice, and he was going to use it. We know that the sheriff recognized this body should, be, should not be found. We know that the sheriff wanted to hide the body, wanted to bury it in Mississippi so that he can say, we don't know what you're talking about. That boy never even got here. One of those kind of lies they'd like to tell. But they put, uh, uh, put him in a, a, a box and dropped it in the river. And some of the greatest men that we never talk about as being great men, though they are, the Pullman Porters heard about it, knew about it, and they too, on that day said, we have a job. We are going to stop this train and we are going to get that body and we are going to take this boy to his mother. So they had to figure out how to stop the train. And one of the Pullman porters went to the, the, the uh, 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 sheriff, the, uh, one of those people, the, the, he, he runs the train, the, the, the master train master and said, there's something wrong. They tried to say, you know, he tommed it. He, well, there's something wrong with the train, something wrong on the, on the tracks. And, and, the, and, and the train master said, nothing wrong with the train. He said, yeah, it feels funny to me. Doesn't it feel funny? On, don't it feel funny to you? And so he said, no, but he thought, well, this Negro probably knows what he's, what he's talking about. He said, well, what should we do? And he said, the Pullman porter said, I will walk in front of the train. And when we get to the problem, I will stop it and I will be able to fix it. And of course, they had no idea what he actually meant because Pullman Porters never spoke English to those people. And he got, he got the, off the train and took a lantern and he walked in front until the people who saw him coming brought the body out. And he waved the lantern and the train stopped. And he took a hammer as if he were straightening something out and he beat the track and beat the track. And Emmett's body in the box was put on the train by the Pullman porters. Then he said, I got it, Masha, I got it. And they went on to Atlanta. And for those of you who know anything, you know that if you died and went to hell, you'd have a stopover in Atlanta. So when they got to Atlanta, it's gonna be a stopover and they're gonna take the box and they're gonna put it on the Chicago train, which they did. But they did not put Emmett in freight because someone might have run into him. Someone might have seen it. Someone might have tried again to hide it. They put it with their personal belongings. And they had his mother called and told her which train and what time. And she and the, and the undertaker met that train. Her name was Mrs. Bradley at that point. They met the train and the body with the box was taken off and they took the top. Everybody kept saying this shouldn't be open and they opened the top and it was a terrible thing. I'm sure you've seen photos of Emmett's body. It's terrible. And she looked at that. If you can imagine your mother looking at you and knowing what, what, an, off, what an awful beating that was. She looked back and, and the undertaker said, Miss Bradley, 
this is, I can't do anything. This is so, this is so horrible. I, I think we should close the casket. And Mrs. Bradley said, I want the world to see what they did to my son. And she opened that casket. And when we had his funeral, the world indeed did see what they did. They did see that two grown men beat a boy practically to a pulp. Jet Magazine put that picture on the cover so that the world did see what they did, which was very, very important. And we get around to December and we have a woman, a nice woman. She's on the bus, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. She's finished working. She's on the bus, she pays her dime because that's segregation. And she had to walk around. She paid her dime in the front and then she had to walk around to the back. And she had to sit under the section that is called the colored section. But there were no more seats in the colored section. So she sat in the very next section, which would be the white section. And it was okay because there were a couple of other people there because the bus was filling up. But in a couple of stops, a white man got on. He paid his dime and walked to the back. And there were no tickets, there were no seats on the white section. I've often wondered, what was he thinking? What made him think he could stand there as he did and look at them and they wouldn't know that they are supposed to get up and get out of his way. But nobody moved. Nobody looked up and nobody moved. The bus driver said, give me those seats. And nobody moved. And the bus driver said again, give me those seats, y'all. And two men on the, on the right side of the aisle and the man, Mrs. Mrs. Parks was sitting on the aisle. The man sitting on the window and I have no, no problem with him at all. The man sitting on the window said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give up. I, I, I don't want to be bothered. So Mrs. Parks stood up to let the man on the window out. And then she sat back down. And the white man standing there absolutely couldn't believe that she sat back down. The bus driver walked back and said, you better give me those seats. And she had nothing to say. There's a gospel tune, there's a, a, a spiritual that says they crucified my Lord. And he never said a mumbling word, not a word, not a mumbling word. And Mrs. Park sat there and the bus driver said, I'm gonna have you arrested. And she did, she then looked up and said, you may do that. And the police came and it took two great big policemen, right? To arrest Mrs. Parks. And Mrs. Parks lived next door to the president of the NAACP. His name was Mr. Nixon. And Mr. Nixon had been out in his yard, had been out uh, gardening. And that somebody ran up to, ran over to his house and said they've arrested Mrs. Parks. And Mr. Nixon did a wonderful thing. He put down his, his, his tools. He went into his home. He took a bath. He got his Sunday best suit out. He got a white shirt out. He put his best tie on. He polished his shoes and walked down to the jail to find out to say he wanted to get her out. And he wanted to look like a businessman. He wanted to look like it was important because it was important. Mrs. Parks was also vice president of the NAACP. And so he got her out. And some people got together, the NAACP got together and said, we're not gonna, we're, we're, we are weary. People try to make her tired, but they weren't tired, they were weary. And she said, they said, we're not gonna ride the bus, stay off the bus tomorrow. We, we, we don't have to be bothered with this. We're gonna stay off the bus. And the bus didn't mind, the, the, the bus company didn't mind because they thought, oh, those Negroes will never do that. They'll never get together. And they stayed off the bus the next day and they stayed off the bus the next day and the next day. So ultimately it's gonna become a bit of a problem. Someone had heard that there was a wonderful young man in Atlanta, Georgia, who was a good speaker. His name was Martin Luther King Jr. 
And they said, oh, we should invite that, that young preacher here because that'll help us. That'll help our spirits. So Martin left Atlanta and went over to Montgomery and he did speak. And the, the boycott went on. The women, and we have to give the women credit because we don't give them nearly enough credit. The women, in order to support the boycott, would get up before dawn, just when, and you've seen it sometime, when it's gray, it's just a little bit gray. And they would get up and they would make lunches for their husbands and their brothers and their daughters and whoever else would need lunch so that they could have it. Then they would cook breakfast for the people that they cooked breakfast for, their husbands, their daughters, whatever. And then they would put dinner on so that when they came home, there would be something to warm for them to eat. And we know that they learned that from old people. They learned that from our ancestors. They learned that from the women who had to go out into the fields and, and pick cotton or pick tobacco or pick whatever was being picked or go up to the big house and change their, their beds or do whatever was being done. They learned that they had to get up before dawn and get something done. And they had to start dinner before they left so that there would be a hot meal. They did that. And we don't give them credit. We don't, we don't even remember what the women did that allowed that boycott to work. But it was a year. And then it was a little more than a year. And finally, the bus company, which didn't like losing money, finally said, well, we're just going to have seating anywhere. I've never understood why white people were afraid to sit next to black people. They did everything else with black people. I just couldn't understand that. What makes you scared of sitting next to me? But they were scared of something because they didn't want to do it. That's why we had segregation. That's why I, to this day, hate movies. I, I grew up with my grandparents. I, I lived a lot, most of my life with my grandparents. And the, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee. And the Bijou Theater, we couldn't go to, there was a theater called the Tennessee, and this was the really big, important one. And then there was the Bijou, which would, as they put it, allow colored. But you paid, you bought your ticket in the front, and then you walked to the back, and then you, you walked up the balcony. And I have hated movies since I don't do them. I think the last movie I saw probably was, was The Godfather. I hate movies. I, I hate what they did or what they tried to do or what they tried to show. But one of the things that I just like, and I'm not picking on her because I think that she probably did the best she could, was there was a movie called Gone with the Wind. You're aware of it. They pulled it because they're kind of trying to straighten it out now. But Gone with the Wind. And Hattie McDaniel played Mammy. And Mammy, after the war, was staying with Miss Scarlett. And of course, we had Prissy. And they said to Prissy, you know, you got to help us with the baby. And Prissy said, I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. And she didn't do it. But Mammy won a, if you call it winning, an Oscar for playing Mammy. And some people criticized that, which maybe, maybe it wasn't fair. I don't know. They criticized that. And said, you know, Hattie McDaniel should not have played that role. Should not have that, that shouldn't have happened. And Miss McDaniel, whom I did not, of course, know, said, I'd rather play a slave than be one. And that's not exactly what she meant, I don't think, because we had and we just lost our soror, Cecily Tyson, who didn't play a slave or be one. We had Lena Horne in movies, our Sora, who didn't play a slave or be one. And it probably would have been nicer if Mitch McDaniel had said, I'm trying to show some level of truth, something to, to do a little more comfort than to try to say the people who don't like what you have done, what you have allowed this image to do to us. She could have done, I think a little better, but it's easier for me to say, it's not me. And of course, Clark Gable, who a lot of people said was passing. So for those of you who ever end up doing a book on, on, on Hollywood movie stars who pass, Clark was one of them, but Clark was there. 
And when she won the award, of course, she was not allowed because she'd have been sitting with, with the so-called white people, with the known white people. So when it did, he sent her a note and said, we missed you, which was very kind of Clark Gable. And hooray for Clark. But we're all, what I'm trying to say to you, is trying to look at what happened and how when our day comes, when our day came, we, we used the tool that we had. Me, I'm just a poet. So all I do, I'm a baby sister. So all of the baby sisters here know exactly what happens. Baby sisters look up to the big sisters and we just think they're wonderful. And we watch them, they can read and we can't read. They can play the piano, we can't play the piano. They can, they can uh, uh, ride a bicycle and we can't, we haven't learned to ride a bicycle yet. The big sisters can do everything and we're very, very proud of them. And we watch. So what you end up with, what a lot of baby sisters end up with is words. And if words are all you have, and that's not an, a light thing, you can ask Socrates, you can ask Jesus. If words are all you have, it's been known to get you killed. But if it's what you have, then you have to use it. You have to use the words to tell the truth. You have to use the words to help climb Jacob's ladder one more step because every round goes higher and higher. And it's a wonderful thing we're here now in 21. And we've seen America make many, many changes and America will continue. Will it be what we want it to be? It's not likely, but it will be better every time. Will we call a lie a lie when we hear it? You bet. Will we call it, will we try to speak the truth when, you, when, when we hear it, when we know it? We will. We will try to continue to go forward. Christopher Columbus, you must remember, was lost. So the people he saw when he landed in this area were not Indians. They were a community. They had their own language. They had their own clothing, their own culinary arts. They were not Indians. And we are now just getting to the point that we are asking, who are you? What is your name? And because of the police who have shot so many young black men in the, in the back, we have watched George Floyd, we watched Mr. Divine, Officer Divine, put his knee on the neck of George Floyd, probably thinking as the people in, in Mississippi did, nobody's gonna remember that I murdered this man, it's not important. And the world remembered. One of the things that we admire so much, we all have to, for black, about Black Lives Matter, is that we, my age, we did civil rights. We worked to take and break down segregation in America. We did a good job because there are no signs saying that no matter what the, the Republicans want. There are no signs. There, we have broken down segregation. You who are in college now are living in a non-segregated world. But between segregation and non-segregation, there's still racism. And you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of where you're going. And you have to be aware of some of the great things. I mentioned a speech and it wasn't a long speech. Everybody knows I have a dream. Everybody knows what a wonderful speech that is. But we need to remember it all started because Moe's right said Darhi because at the risk of his life, Moses said, I will, I will call, I will call it what it is. And at some point, so will you. We are proud of you as we are incredibly proud of Black Lives Matter because they took it the next step. They fo followed it. Every round, every round goes higher and higher. So, Black Lives Matter, what we did in civil rights, Black My Lives Matter, is done globally. When I was watching on television, I was watching the protest, and I could look, and there was Perth, Australia, and I'll never get over that. 
Perth, Australia was, 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 was demonstrating with Black Americans. Black Lives Matter is global. And it's so important that those three women decided that today is the day that we step up. And there will come a day when you will have your day. And that will be good. You don't have to push forward. You don't have to do anything because it will come. And your ancestor, your mother, your great-grandmother, your something will say to you, you have to stand up so that you can now, once again, sit down. We want you to graduate because those people sitting in heaven want to see you graduate because they fought and died for you to be in a college. You owe them that. And we hope that you do. And we want to see you go forward. We want to see you be happy too, because everybody says, how can you be happy under these circumstances? Well, you can't let these fools take your happiness away. Or they've killed not only you, but other people. They've killed They've killed it all. They've, they, they have taken the life. What's important, what's very important. So find a way to love the people who love you. You find a way to be patient with the people who were patient with you. You find a way to reach out, to be responsible for the families you made or the families you were a part of, whichever way you want to call it. You find a way to be grown up about a lot of things. And we are very proud of you in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And North Carolina is an important state, and we know that. I want you, I hope that you are registered to vote, and I hope that you find a way to keep the love of yourself and your people and the idea of freedom in your heart. So I thank you for inviting me this evening to be a part of you. They don't allow me to touch machines, or I, I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what to do. Ah, oh, there she is. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um. Wow, Miss Giovanni, we thank you for sharing this message with us. It was very inspirational, thought provoking, and forward thinking. We are reminded that we must continue to be our true selves in this society while pushing forward to advocate for and make change on all fronts. We are so grateful to have you with us for the evening. Before we move into our Q&A session, I would like to give a special thank you to all of our sponsors. The Spring 2021 Community Connections events are sponsored and supported by a combination of ECSU student fees, a private donation from trustee Phyllis Bosomworth, Microsoft, First Citizens Wealth Management, Duke Energy Foundation, and the National Endowment for the, for the Arts. Now, let us move into our Q&A session. We will begin with a few questions that were emailed directly to the Community Connections email account. So the first question is, you've had a tremendous influence on many people through your writings, lectures, and public appearances. Starting out, did you aspire to be as influential as you are? No, I just wanted to be as honest as I could be. And, uh, I'm always surprised. Um, I think I came up as poetry was um, beginning to, to have much more attention uh, being paid. But I was born, I think I mentioned that in Knoxville, Tennessee, and my parents moved, uh, all of us, well, the, I have an older sister, and the four of us moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. Our neighbor in Cincinnati is gonna be Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Now, Mr. Dunbar is gonna be dead before I am you know, he's gone before I got there. But being that close to Paul Lawrence Dunbar and watching how he conducted his life, Mr. Dunbar, and, and I still think it's fabulous, was able to purchase a home 
for himself and his family, and he purchased a home next door for his mother. Now, I don't know, and, and I, I should look into it, I guess. I don't know if there's a tunnel that he put so that should there be a problem, because there are always riots going on, he would be able to go and get his mother. But Mr. Dunbar was one of the first, probably the first Black poet, certainly, to be able to earn a living from his work, to be able to take his work out. And of course, we know Mr. Dunbar's work uh, now, mostly through Maya, because I know why the cage bird sings. And we keep that poem stays alive, as do other poems. And so, you know, you, you don't know, you don't know what your, your influence would be. You only know that you can be honest, that you can be the best poet that you can be. And you hope that people can find something in your work that, that's meaningful to them. Okay. And now, after a long and storied career, what's your secret for maintaining your relevance amidst a new generation of readers and listeners? Well, I, I, I don't know what, <laughs> I'm getting hard questions. And I, I think that the main thing um, with any career is you have to enjoy what you do. And I know that Elizabeth City, because I know that the South has the storytellers. There are some storytellers coming from the North, it's not that, but the South has the storytellers. And one of the things that we know, if you're thinking about, oh, I think I'd like to be a writer, I, I'm enjoying, I enjoy writing. Then one of the things you wanna do, and I can say this, is you wanna read. Every day, you wanna read something. People, a lot of people will say, well, I have to write, you know, every day I have to write. I actually have a friend who used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and write till his wife just got sick of it. And I don't blame her. You, <laughs> who wants some, somebody, you know, at five o'clock in the morning. But what, what, what you're trying to do is, is to make sure something is coming in. And that's what's important. You, you have to read. And I would say that anybody that wants to be a writer has to read. You have to, you just have to have books and you have to read a lot of books and a lot of different books. You will read what, 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 what's interesting to you because there are a variety of things that are interesting to you that other people don't. Some people like one thing, some people like another. I really like turtles. And I used to go down to Mexico for, for a while and I haven't been now in, in, in like six years, seven years, but I used to go down to a little uh, turtle preserve uh, in Zuadanego and we would be there when the turtles hatched. And so, and I'm saying we, the, those of us who were there, usually there were like six or seven of us and the turtles would hatch and we would put uh, tents up so that the birds, because the birds wanted to, of course, eat the turtles. And we would put tents up when the, when the turtles hatch, we would put the tents up so that the birds couldn't come down and the birds would complain, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the, uh, the turtles were okay, they were gonna be okay. And what we did with those turtles was we put them in a, 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 a swimming pool, like what kids in the cities have, and put some water, you know, they put the, the, the water there. And for three days, we kept the turtles so that they could learn. We didn't feed them because you don't wanna, you don't wanna spoil them like that. We didn't feed them or anything, but we let them swim around, they got their strength. And then in the evening, one evening, on that third evening, we would take the turtles down to, down to the sea, down to, to, the, to the Gulf. If, which we have no way of knowing, I mean, now we probably could tag them, but in those days we, we, we couldn't. But if they could swim, if they could get out of the Gulf, they could live to be a hundred years old. And it was such a pleasure to watch them. The hardest part for, for those of us who were a part of the preserve, the most difficult part was to stand still because we could take the, 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 the uh, uh, swimming pool down, the little swimming pool down, and we could hold it, but we're gonna have to let it go and the turtles are going to go out there. This tide is going to come in, and this is gonna be the difficult part. The tide is gonna come in and you cannot move because if you lift your foot up, there's a good chance you would step on a turtle. So you have to learn how to let the tide come up and let it go back out. And then you, you wish the little turtles luck. And I like to think every time I see something with the turtles, I like to think maybe this is one of the turtles that I was there when, 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 when she was born. I hope so. 
but that's what I, I that's what I'm interested in. Okay. At what point in your life did you realize the power and conflict of your black and woman voice? I think that you only have, and I, I mentioned this earlier, and, and I, I'm not nagging about that, but you only have one voice. And I think that the thing that was the most, um, uh, uh, not pressure, but that most had uh, uh, something on me that I needed to do was that I was a baby sister. And if you're a baby sister, you, you can compete and a lot of people a lot of people do. I was, uh, I'm a history major in college. And uh, of course, everybody pays attention to and loves because the British history, we all speak English, so there's no reason. It's not English anyway, it's American. But uh, I, I was watching, you know, you watch some of the, 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 the baby sisters. Margaret was not a good baby sister because Elizabeth had nothing to do when she was born. But Margaret was jealous. You had that kind of thing. Harry has nothing to do with William because William was born first. And so if, there, if, if, if the Elizabeth ever decides to die, um, it, it should be Charles. And if that's the case, then it will definitely be, be William, but we don't know. But I think that the, the thing that had the biggest influence is the word I'm looking for, is that um, I was a baby sister and I accepted that role uh, ha happily, actually. I could watch and then I, I could weave my own stories around being a baby sister, being a, 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 about what I see what I know. All right, this next question is a little bit more lengthier, but it's a lot to unpack at the same time. Does the world need Black people and non-wealthy people who study and earn degrees in the arts and humanities? If so, why? What do they contribute and how do we broach those conversations on HBCU campuses and in Black communities, both of which are under economic pressure to produce graduates with majors that appear to sound more appealing to the marketplace? Um, the easy answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, obviously, I mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention again, it is very important that you register to vote. Because if we had more people in Congress, we could stabilize and get more money into Black communities. We have allowed the so-called rich to get away with it because the rich keep getting elected. And uh, I'm not against the rich film, but I just think that it's time that we think about what makes the, what makes the country grow. And what makes the country grow is that there's, a, 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 there's some, some level of, of, of equity. I am personally very much in favor of student loans being forgiven. That there's, makes sense to me. If we forgive the student loans, if we say, don't worry about it, no more student loans, if we forgive the student loans, then the students will have money. And one of the parts of, of their having money, they will buy clothes because you kids buy clothes. And you will buy, uh, 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 what is that stuff? Cosmetics, because you always want to look good. Most of you will probably buy an automobile and I teach at Virginia Tech where we helped to perfect the electric car. So you're gonna be buying a different car that's gonna go a different way. You're, you're needing some level of home. So whether that's to rent or whether that's to, to, uh, to purchase, that's gonna be another question. But nonetheless, we need to free the money so that you can spend it, so that you can take your mother or your grandmother out to dinner, so that you can, Kevin, take your girlfriend or your wife out to dinner because the, the, the person that has been hurting the most, the business hurting the most right now has been restaurants. Nobody can, aside from the fact that, that the COVID is a serious disease, nobody can afford to go out. And, and somebody said, and I, I, I mean no disrespect here, well, we're gonna put up some new restaurants and there's gonna be a Wendy's and there's gonna be a, uh, what else did they say? A, a, a Burger King and something. I said, that's not a restaurant, that's a drive-through. And, and the restaurants that we are, we need restaurants and the restaurants are the ones where you can sit down with a white tablecloth. And we need to be able to have people have money to do that. So I would like very much to see the students get their money because we want, we want them to be educated. 
being educated is as important. It's, it's, we, we want you to go to college. And there are things that you need to know. There are things that you're going to need to know as you go ahead and begin a career. There are things that, that your college education won't teach you, but we know that arts and crafts is important. As I mentioned, I am a Fisk University graduate, and it's very important because Fisk was one of the first black schools. General Fisk uh, was why, why we were named, was one of the first black schools for liberal arts. How do we, how do we learn to dream and imagine without liberal arts? So everybody says, well, it's very important. The, the uh, uh, engineers are important, but there would be no engineers if we didn't have the, 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 the liberal arts dreaming about what, what could be. And so I think we need to recognize that uh, we and you, I should say, you youngsters are not just being sent someplace to learn something, to work and work and work and drop dead. You, 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 you're there. Liberal arts teaches us not just that you are living, but why and what you can do with it. So liberal arts is very, very important. I also, I must say, before you close me off, I must say, I also know that it's very important that we, especially in, in the United States, that we learn uh, other languages. We, we don't know, most of us in the United States don't know we love enough languages. And that also is gonna be a job creation. We need to hire people to speak very variations of Spanish. We definitely need to hire people who speak uh, uh, Chinese, some, and there are variations on Chinese too. But I asked my class uh, at the beginning of school year, how many of you have ever eaten Chinese food? And every hand, every hand in the room went up. And I said, how many of you, eat, how many of you speak Chinese? And only one, 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 one young lady speaks Chinese. Nobody else did. And I'm not knocking the rest of us because I don't speak Chinese and I don't know how to eat with chopsticks. But I know it would be good for America, since we're the ones right now who are, are having a, a, a problem with we're, we're borderline depression, that we could hire more people. And if we hired them to teach languages, if we hired them to teach how to eat with a chopstick, we would put people to work and that would put money circulating. And you don't have to be smart to know if money circulates, everybody benefits. This next question asks, how do you handle criticism about your writing from your peers? Do you follow any rules with your poetry? Um, I seldom read criticism. Uh, I, I know I should probably do better. Uh, usually there's somebody, uh, you know, my, my, my attorney or uh, my friend Jenny reads a lot and she'll say, oh, you should read this. It's really a good, it's a good review of your book. And then I'll read it. Uh, if it's not a good review, she would never say, and I don't. I, I, I really am not, not that interested in what other people have to say, because I do what I do, and I would urge them to do what, what they do. <laughs> it's that simple. We, uh, everybody has some idea of what you, and I say you, but I don't mean you, but I mean, everybody's got an idea of, well, you should have done this, or it should have done that, but there is a man named Thelonious Monk. And I really love Monk. I'm a jazz fan. I really love Monk. And Monk, no, Monk, Monk, Monk plays funny. And somebody was interviewing Monk early in, in his career. And they said, you know, the problem here, Mr. Monk, is that, you know, you, you get all these wrong notes. <laughs> and Monk looked up from the piano and he said, the piano don't have no wrong notes. And I've always loved that. I feel the same way about jazz. Jazz does not have bad poems. It has poems that have not found their way yet. There's no such thing as a bad poem. So I don't, I don't really care what the so-called critics say. Who, who's heard of them? I don't know these people. <laughs> why, why should I care what they say? And this next question asks, at one point you rolled up your shirt sleeve to reveal a beautiful tattoo you inked on your arm in tribute to Tupac Shakur. Mr. Shakur has now been dead a quarter century. What are your thoughts on his legacy as a poet? We are still, and we probably will forever, discuss Pac because Tupac is an important man. And Tupac had something to say to a generation. 
there were a lot of people around when Pop was around, and we don't remember them, thank God. And a lot of them were ugly and mean people, so I'm glad that we don't. And a lot of them, Kanye West is crazy and needs to be hospitalized. He, 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 whatever mind he used to have when his mother was alive is gone now. But Pac stood up for the people and he tried to spot, put a light on it. I still, I, I didn't, I used to have it. I, I have my, my thug light. It's only, only two, it's only a tattoo that I have. And I, I, I got the tattoo when Pac was, 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 was murdered, when he, when he died, when he was assassinated actually, because I didn't want his mother to think that she was alone. And there's, there's nothing that I can think of that's more difficult than having to bury your child. I was too young when Emmett was murdered. I, I was too young to think about things like that. But when Pac was murdered, Pac was uh, assassinated, I thought I have to do something just to let his mother know if, and I don't know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know her, but if I would ever know her, so that she could know she was not, she was not alone. Tupac's influence remains and it will remain. And there will be other books and there will be other movies and there will be other songs, but Pac will be around. He's, he's not, Pac isn't going away. Unfortunately, this is our last question for the evening. Given all that you have accomplished, and that has been so much, what is the one message you leave with us as it pertains to your already established legacy? I think the main thing, I think that life is a good idea. So the main thing that I would like to leave with, with, with you youngsters there, if I may put it that way, is life is there for you to enjoy. You're gonna have to do your work because we all do. There are gonna be sad things because there's always some sadness. We're gonna to have to talk to some people that we don't like because there are always some people we don't like. But life is a good idea. So the main thing you want to do is to make sure you have somebody in your life that you trust and that you love. You don't, you don't want to show off to people that you don't know or give a damn about. You just wanna find that group that you could count on. And I don't know, do we have time for me to read a poem? Because if we do, I'd like to read a poem I wrote for my friend, Tony Morrison. And Tony said at one point in discussing something else, there's nothing to talk about with slavery. There's not even a bench. And everybody then started to put a bench. Benches are all over now uh, in, in America and actually in Europe for Toni Morrison. I wrote a poem because I realized that that's a metaphor. It's not just a, a phys physical thing, it's a metaphor. Benches aren't just pieces of furniture. Sure, we find them at rest stops where birds have stopped over and truck drivers have pulled aside to smoke a cigarette, no matter how bad they are for you. And yes, in fabulous museums, we find benches decorated sometimes with gold or bronze and the faces of the famous. Sometimes we even find benches among the poor, which are simply logs put one across the other, or sometimes just bricks piled and put deeply enough into the, uh, into the earth to stabilize those who need comfort. But benches are actually a metaphor. They are friends we call on on sad days. They are two old ladies who bring duck eggs when your grandmother passes. They are a friend's mother who makes a quilt for you when she hears you have lung cancer. And mostly they are the voice on the other end of the phone who says, right, when you are so sad at losing your mother, right, when you don't know where to go, right, when the only person who can read you is on a cross, right, because that is your job. Find a bench, find your bench. Thank you so much for that. Um, I would like to note that everyone will receive a survey within the next one to two days, allowing you the opportunity to provide additional feedback. Um, this information will be helpful as we continue to plan events that bring the university and community closer together. Thank you again. 
Good evening. Thank I am you. Kevin Wade, Thanks, Associate Kevin. Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. On behalf of Elizabeth City State University, the Community Connections Committee, and our sponsors, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. Ms. Giovanni, you have truly been inspirational, and we appreciate you spending time with us on this evening. It is our hope that you will return and join us for our upcoming Community Connections events. Remember, all of our Spring 2021 events are free. On March 31st at 6 p.m., we will host Ambassadors of Art, a captivating cultural connection featuring the Dallas Black Dance Theater in an interactive virtual performance. And on April 8th at 7 p.m., we welcome Mr. Fred Humphreys, Vice President of U.S. Government Affairs at Microsoft. Mr. Humphreys will join us on campus to provide an exclusive in-person lecture, which will be limited to capacity, but also live stream. Thank you and have a good night. Viking Pride.